I am very pleased to welcome back for the first time in many, many years uh, Dr. Steve Best, uh, who told me I could told me that in the interest of time I could forego my biography for him, which was a little bit out of date anyway, and uh, simply say that uh, he's an animal rights advocate, author, and professor of philosophy at the University of Texas, and he has a forthcoming book coming out, which is Total Liberation, Revolution for the 21st Century. Let's hear it, everyone, for Dr. Steve Beck. Thanks. It's great to be back to this forum after a long time. I've been asked to talk about the history and philosophy of animal rights, so I'll do that, and please, I don't want to be too contentious. But uh, the philosophy and the history of animal rights uh, has been um, formulated in opposition to the philosophy and history of animal welfare. So I'll say a few things about that and uh, try to underscore what I think is the real significance of our movement. Um, views of animal welfare actually can be traced back as far as the Old Testament. We find emphases there of treating animals kindly and not unnecessarily abusing them or causing them pain without some sufficient reason. That's very different from the uh, logic uh, nature of animal rights, as I'll try to uh, show. Uh, both welfareism, however, uh, in its utilitarian context, I'll describe, and rights have emerged in a modern context, the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, that is very much bound up with capitalist societies. So when we look at uh, modern welfareism, uh, animal welfareism, we see it's associated with the theories of utilitarianism, which have been developed in the 18th and 19th century by thinkers such as Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Of course, the emphasis of utilitarianism uh, comes out of capitalism, capitalist society, because it emphasized the primary values were pleasure, happiness, and some kind of utility seeking, which is what the economists and revolutionaries of capitalist society were doing. Uh, perhaps in some vulgar way, but that's what they were doing. Utilitarianism, of course, says that the right action is the action that brings the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people. Now, that's a very um, self-evident and satisfying philosophy, right? Because it seems to benefit the majority. In fact, that philosophy, although it came out of capitalist society, was very subversive of capitalist society. Because if put into practice, we're really talking more about a socialist kind of ideology in society than capitalism, right? Because capitalism is based upon a minority of a class domination over the majority of people. So in fact, if this utilitarianism were put into play socially, economically, and politically, we would have a, a situation where the 99% are dominating society instead of the 1%, which is what we have now. So in terms of uh, animal moral status, utilitarianism was also a very satisfying doctrine because it shifted the whole ballgame all the way from Aristotle to Descartes and Kant, every damn philosopher and major thinker in Western society said, animals can't have rights because they don't have reason. And everything turned on this concept that animals don't have reason, although we have always overestimated our rationality and underestimated the rationality or intelligence of animals, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. What an irony. What an irony. We're not that intelligent of a species. We're destroying our own world. So what utilitarianism did was says no. It's not rationality that's important, it's sentience, their ability to feel. And then you have moral interest. So of course, as Jeremy Bentham put it, the question is not, can they think, can animals think? The question is not, can they reason? The question is, can they feel? We know the answer to that. God damn it, we know the answer to that in every film we see and every banal or marvelous experience we have with animals, we know the answer to that question. But utilitarianism became anchored to animal welfareism in a somewhat conservative way. 
Because although it endowed animals with a moral status, this moral status was uh, something that could be traded away for utility, for a greater gain. Oh, well, if humans can exploit animals and we can get a greater gain or benefit out of it, then so be it. Just don't punish them, hurt them unnecessarily. If you have to, sacrifice their interest toward ours. If you have to, sacrifice their interest to a greater interest, the human interest. And so it was done. And so it was done uh, historically and always throughout history. And utilitarianism and its welfarist implications became the dominant way of assigning animals' moral status uh, until animal rights emerged late in the 20th century, in the 1980s and thereon. Now, rights discourse, too, comes out of capitalist society. It comes out of natural law philosophy from thinkers uh, such as uh, John Locke. It comes out of the American and French revolutions. This discourse did not exist before the American and French revolutions in that era. It emerged, rights emerged in a capitalist context that assigned individuals the liberties to pursue their freedoms and their visions of the good life as they saw fit. Fundamentally, these liberties were economic because this was a capitalist movement. And fundamentally, rights were property rights, the right to accumulate capital and land and power as one could in a competitive social relationship. That's what rights was all about. But rights had another face to it, a subversive logic, an important logic that we're all clinging to today. Because rights also had not just an economic development of laissez-faire, competitive capitalism, rights also had a profound legal, political, and moral status in that it guaranteed basic liberties and basic freedoms, not just to exploit, but to speak and to live a life free of exploitation, certainly at least in theory. Now, Marx said uh, that capitalism creates its own grave diggers. A capitalist society creating a mass industrial labor force creates its own grave diggers. It, it, like Frankenstein, creates powers that it cannot control. Well, that's what happened with rights. Because capitalists created economic rights and dressed them up in political, moral, legal rights. But these political, moral, and legal rights proved to be very subversive. They proved to be the grave diggers of this system to a certain extent, right? Because the exploited use rights in their own interest. Labor and other elements of the population that are exploited began to use rights as their own moral coinage to protect their own interests and their own freedoms, their freedom from exploitation. So what happened with rights it was a very subversive logic. It began to spread and spread and spread away from just a white economic uh, elite toward all sectors of a disadvantaged and oppressed and exploited society, to include gender, to include sexual identity, to include uh, ability, to include virtually every marginalized social class could use this language of rights to appropriate their own freedoms against the uh, exploiters and the expropriators in capitalist society. And so soon it would just be a matter of logic and time when people began demanding rights for animals. In fact, the very era, the very moment that rights began to appear for in human, in a human context, you already see people speaking of animal rights. And I'm talking about the 17th, 18th century, you can see reference to animal rights. Not just welfare, but animal rights. But it was through welfareism that uh, this, this movement would eventually advance. And it was through welfareism that uh, a lot of important things happened through animals. And this, this developed further, of course, uh, in animal rights. Now, um, in their logic, moral rights, animal rights, are the following. One, they are egalitarian. They establish intrinsic value for all beings who have value. Uh, suffering is suffering. Captivity is captivity, and exploitation is exploitation for the animal rights movement. 
building on this idea that human beings are, are fundamentally equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and we just have to extend that to the next step and say that uh, animals are also of the same equality, and in fact, use utilitarianism to do this. Notice how these two logics, these two philosophies that have been so counterposed in modern uh, history, such as between Mill and Kant, if you know that reference, these come together, really, in the context of rights for animal rights. Um, we're no longer talking about, with animal rights, responsibilities to animals, being kind of animals. We're talking about the rights of animals, not our responsibilities to animals, the rights of animals. So we're not talking about kindness anymore. We're talking about justice. These are two Kindness, <laughs> absolutely. But that has a kind of condescending quality to it. And we realize that animals are equals, that we are animals, then we recognize that these are our brothers and sisters, our brethren in the evolutionary world. They are not to be considered in any other way. More rights are not just egalitarian, they are abolitionist. So when uh, a, a, they demand not the regulation of exploitation, but the elimination of exploitation. <laughs> and rights also are inalienable. Inalienable, they cannot be traded away. They cannot be bargained for. You cannot say, well, you can have uh, some of this being's uh, interest can be sacrificed for another being's interest if it brings a greater utility. No. And even if it does bring a great utility, and this is the argument for vivisection, right? We need vivisection for so-called medical progress. No! Even if it does bring an alleged great utility, it's still wrong. It's still wrong and wrong. It's trying to have a vivisection. That's what rights do. Rights give beings interests that are inalienable. They cannot be traded away or bargained for. Animal rights is rooted in an analogical argument. It says that uh, if humans have rights, animals have rights for the very same purposes because of shared characteristics. It says that if racism and sexism are wrong, then speciesism also is wrong. And let's be logical about this. The quick counter argument to this uh, position is that, well, there are, there are fundamental differences between humans and animals, or between human and non-human animals. There are fundamental differences. And of course, people of color and women have the same rights as, uh, as uh, white and meat. Of course they do. But with animals, we're really talking about differences in, in kind, and not just in degree. We're talking about something qualitative and fundamentally different. Well, no, we're not. No, we're not, because we're really the basic moral touchstone for any theory of value has to be sentience and not alleged irrationality. No, we're not because notice that the logic of equality is also a logic of difference. Look at all the people in this room tonight. We have people of different ages, we have people of different genders, of course, and we have to some degree people of different ethnicities or races. And is, uh, does that mean that because there are differences, we're not all the same, we don't have the same moral and intrinsic value? No, no. And I hear some, we have some dogs in the room, too. <laughs> I haven't heard any cats speak up, but I've heard some dogs. And imagine if we had giraffes or elephants in the room, okay? Does that mean that suddenly the moral picture of this room has changed? No. We all have fundamental interests. We all feel pain. We all have desires and pleasures in life that, that we want to be satisfied and that should be respected. And so there is, of course, difference. But these differences are not morally relevant. Factual differences amongst people between human and non-human animals, but they're not morally relevant. So the logic of equality really is a logic of difference as well. If we eliminate all of the bogus arguments that are used to buttress human supremacy, we come down to this. That rights are legal and moral constructs to to protect any being that has interest. If you have an interest in living well rather than living hell, if you have an interest in that, then you have a right to protect it according to any decent, moral, philosophical, or legal argument. So 
Although whites really have nothing to do, despite all the philosophical bullshit over thousands of years, whites really have nothing to do with culture, alleged culture, language, alleged language, and reason, alleged reason. Rights have fundamentally to do with interest and sentience. And that's where we draw the line. The line now is to be drawn between sentient and non-sentient life, between subjects and objects, and not between human and non-human animals anymore. Rights have a two-sided nature. They protect the liberties and interests of the rights bearer, and they also impose obligations or restrictions on others not to harm the rights bearer. You know, uh, animal exploiters always complain about us, don't they? They say that we seek to take away their freedom. They are entirely correct. We do seek, we do seek to take away their freedom to exploit animals. We do seek to abolish fur farms. We do seek to abolish services. We do seek to abolish rodeos. We do seek to abolish food section. We do seek to abolish the meat dairy egg industry.
Uh, well, what happened with the mainstream animal rights movement in the 1980s and 1990s is it became a bit regulated, huh? It became a bit, uh, if you will, uh, co-opted uh, and uh, working hand in hand with other industries. Uh, but uh, this is what Gary Francione said about the change. With his critique of the welfareism, not just welfareism, but new welfareism, where welfareists are suddenly people who talk about the language of rights, and I think we all agree the language of rights are not running short, but uh, who also uh, will, will try, to, try to use uh, uh, Greek reformist policies to, to reach those rights. Okay? I'm not here to judge on that issue because that's very complicated arguments can be made on both sides, but that, that was Francione's uh, argument. And so uh, Francione uh, claims himself to be an abolitionist, to reinforce abolitionism. But he, he really, uh, if we're talking about co-optation, his own abolitionism was co-opted because it, it is linked to very private, subjectivist, consumer policies of veganism. We're not political on the streets anymore. Okay? We're not doing civil disobedience like Martin Luther King did in the 1960s. No, we're in our homes enjoying these great vegan meals, and that's fine. But the politics of this has been evacuated from this movement and it needs to be restored. power, 
and what people perceive to be their God-given right to exploit other species. To change these attitudes and the systems that they inform is to change the very nerve centers of human consciousness. But that is our task, and no more and no less. Thank you.